Hi there, in Italy. Tony Atwood here in uh, Brisbane, in Australia, where the weather is very, very different from what you're experiencing in Italy at the moment. Very hot and sunny and subtropical here. But today we're going to focus on progress in understanding autism in the last 10 years. Now, as a clinical psychologist, I've been exploring autism now for 50 years. And in fact, this year is my 50th anniversary of exploring autism. But the focus for the moment is going to be what have we learned in the last 10 years, but also where do we want to go in the next 10 years exploring autism? So when we look at the characteristics, one of the first things is diagnosis. What is autism? How do we define it? It's always a work in progress and there are always changes as new information clinically and academically is identified that may explain some of the, I wouldn't necessarily say unique characteristics of autism because it's diagnosed by a profile. Nothing is unique to autism, but that profile is quite distinct. Now in 2013, we had some new diagnostic criteria, DSM-5. Stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. But there's no statistics in it. But anyway, it's new in terms of, throughout the world, being one of the main, should we say, diagnostic criteria to identify autism in a child or adult. So the new diagnostic criteria have been an improvement on DSM-4 in terms of accepting camouflaging, that sometimes an autistic individual may hide their autistic features, may have the ability to suppress their autism and to, should we say, imic, sorry, mimic, imitate and be like other people for a short period of time, but it's exhausting. So there is the acknowledgement that autism may not be apparent until circumstances exceed the abilities of that individual. But it was also very important that it acknowledged sensory sensitivity. Um, autistic individuals in conversations, in autobiographies, explain how the noises, the bright lights, the smells, the touch, the sensory world is overpowering. So in 2013, that was legitimized and is in one of the diagnostic criteria. So DSM-5 also had a change in abandoning the term Asperger's syndrome, named after Hans Asperger, a Viennese paediatrician who in the late 1930s, early 1940s, described a group of children at his clinic in Vienna that seemed to have certain characteristics in common. And he used the term, uh, I suppose in a way, autistic personality to describe children, mainly boys who had difficulties with social engagement, had interests that were really quite extraordinary and engaging. But it was the friendship side and the social side and intense emotions that he was very concerned about and described those children that we now or used to call Asperger's syndrome in detail. Now, in the last 10 years, unfortunately, there has been a movement to criticize Hans Asperger as a Nazi because he was there in Austria at the time of the Nazi regime. But it doesn't necessarily make him a Nazi. In fact, he was never a member of the Nazi party, which was unusual for somebody in a high status profession. But also in reading his descriptions of autism, there are none of the politics of racial purity and, shall we say, abandoning uh, those who are different to be sent to centres where they would be basically murdered. And um, I think it is most unfortunate that he's assumed to be a Nazi when the impression I have is of someone who is actually very kind, very supportive, but living in very difficult times. So. We now no longer use the term Asperger's syndrome officially. However, um, the American Psychiatric Association, who first coined the term autism spectrum disorder in their 2013 document, really cannot stop people still using the term Asperger's syndrome. 
And in my reports, I will say, the person has autism spectrum disorder level one, formerly known as Asperger's syndrome. So in many ways, we will continue to use the term Asperger's syndrome and have parallel to that, the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria. So that's one of the major themes that have occurred in the last 10 years in diagnosis. What's gonna happen in DSM-6? I'm not sure. However, what has happened uh, recently is the development of screening tools that are on the internet and available to clinicians to screen for autism in a variety of settings. Now, in part, this is to identify autistic girls and women. I'm going to talk about that in more detail a little bit later, but the profile and pattern in girls and women can be different. And many of the screening tools were based on autistic males. So myself and others have developed screening tools for autistic children and women, but also screening tools for camouflaging, sensory sensitivity, a whole range of aspects of autism in the screening tools is now much more uh, accurate. Now, this is going to be important, as I'll explain later, about autism in association with eating disorders, gender dysphoria, personality disorders. Is it associated with schizophrenia and so on? So what's happening is a lot of services for a variety of psychological conditions need to screen for autism because they will have autistic individuals in their intake, support and therapy. So those screening tools to identify autism in the early intake of eating disorders, etc., needs to be a regular process. Another thing that's developing is diagnosis in infancy. And we now have the ability to videotape and analyze uh, almost newborn <laughs> infants. And what's tended to occur is we know that if you have an autistic child, there is the possibility of having another one, actually 35%, one in three chance that a subsequent child will be autistic. And so researchers have taken families where there's one autistic child. And if there's another child, then as soon as they can record them on video assessment profiles, all sorts of things to find out, are there any characteristics we can identify consistently that can predict a probability of autism at six months, a year, 18 months, two years. The general consensus is you can see some signs at six months, but you can't be 100% sure. At one year, there are some features that are of, of concern. 18 months, yes, there are some features. Around about two years, yes, you can pick that up. But that tends to be what DSM-5 calls autism level three, the more conspicuous autism. But often ASD level two and especially level one may not be picked up until the child goes to school or for the girls because of their camouflaging and coping mechanisms till the teenage years. So it does mean that diagnosis in infancy is on the way. We are identifying some characteristics because for the, some of the families that I see, they will say, you've seen my son, he's six years old now. We have a new baby. The baby was born three months ago. Tony, do you think the baby has autism? And that's what we're starting to look at and clinicians are trying to explore further those characteristics. Now, another interesting area related to diagnosis is prevalence. How common is autism? When I started 50 years ago, it was one in 2,500 children. And autism was viewed as very conspicuous, not speaking a uh, special school or going into a government institution during childhood. But autism was the silent, aloof, withdrawn child. We now know that it is a, shall we say, a much broader continuum or spectrum that does exist, but we're only exploring that narrow section and it is much broader and moves into the normal range. Now, one of the major institutions for looking at prevalence of a variety of conditions is the Centers for Disease Control in the United States. Now, 
in the last few weeks, they have actually published a new prevalence and it changes every year or two. Now they did research in 11 states of the USA screening for autistic characteristics in terms of those who had been formally diagnosed. And the ratio now is one in 44 eight-year-old children. Far more frequent than we used to think. So one in 44 eight-year-old children. Now, they viewed that the male-female ratio was four boys to each girl. However, our research and my clinical experience indicates that the true ratio is two to one, not four to one. So if you are diagnosing autism in the community with eight-year-old children, you're missing many of the girls who are effectively camouflaging and boys can camouflage too. You're missing out on those that will be diagnosed in their teen or adult years because the adult ratio is two to one. So I think that the prevalence will eventually include the diagnosis in the teenage and adult years and will be an even lower rate than one in 44. Now the research has started to look at intellectual ability and when I began 50 years ago the view was autism is associated with profound intellectual disability. Someone who doesn't speak is unable to adapt to an ordinary conventional classroom. But we now know that 60% of autistic children and adults have an IQ in the normal range. So in other words, the majority of autistic individuals do not have an intellectual disability. It's important to recognize that. Now, clinically, what I'm getting is a, a deluge now of diagnoses of adults who say, I have an autistic son or daughter. And when I was filling in the assessment of my son or daughter uh, about their abilities and difficulties and so on, I thought, that was me. I was like that when I was that age. And do I have autism? So we're identifying parents who say, hmm, I can see the pattern in my son or daughter was the same as my pattern when I was a child and seek a diagnostic assessment. Or people learn about extended family members, a cousin who has the characteristics and the family may suggest that in a broader family uh, context. But also the general public is more aware of autism from the media, films, a whole range of aspects. When I began, again, 50 years ago, if I said I'm specializing in autism, there would, most people I would meet, a taxi driver would say, autism, never heard of it. Tell me, what's autism? Now, if I'm in a taxi and I say I work in the area of autism, oh yes, I know about autism. My neighbor's son has autism. I was at school with an autistic child. I have a child with autism myself. So the general public is becoming more aware of what's occurring, in which case the diagnosis of adults is a new area where we have to look at how was the profile of autism changed over time and residual autism, camouflaged autism, all those sorts of components are new in our diagnostic process. But as I said earlier, the recurrence rate is around about 35%. In other words, if you have one autistic child, you've got a one in three chance of a subsequent child being on the spectrum, which means that clinically, I have families with more than one child on the spectrum, sometimes two, three or four children and cousins on the spectrum and that will affect aspects of the family dynamics and the need for family support but within that family if you have two or three on the spectrum then they're not going to be duplicates of each other they can be very different characters now we're starting to explore what we call autism pure and autism plus Autism pure is just autism, nothing else. You have DSM-5 sections A, B and C and D. They are confirmed, but nothing else. And that is about 15% of those diagnosed as autistic. Now this group have a much better prognosis. And in fact, 
may progress in learning how to um, socialize effectively, how to um, cope with various challenges in their daily life, changes, sensory sensitivity and so on, and such that the characteristics become subclinical. And what I'm doing now, and it's not that rare, is undiagnosing perhaps late teens, early twenties. So the characteristics were very conspicuous at two, three, four years old, but at 23, 24 years old, the person is independent in daily living skills, has got a good job, maybe starting a relationship. And so the need for support has diminished sufficiently that that person is self-sufficient, coping, coping really well, so that they are no longer autistic according to the diagnostic criteria. And about one in six of autistic individuals will become sub clinical. Under stress, those characteristics may become greater, but I may sometimes remove, with the person's approval and to their advantage, the diagnosis to see it as a developmental delay, not necessarily an eternal absence. However, 85% are autism plus. Now this is autism plus an anxiety disorder, depression, ADHD, specific learning difficulties such as dyslexia, a personality disorder such as borderline personality disorder as an adaptation to autism, trauma, gender dysphoria or an eating disorder. So I'm going to explore each of those uh, a little bit more. And Emotions are a real challenge for autistic individuals and often the emotions are a greater challenge than the social difficulties and so on. And one thing that those who have autism are very good at is worrying, high levels of anxiety, which may be of greater concern in their daily life than the other aspects. So they're going to need understanding and support for anxiety. Depression is also very common. This can be cyclical, but can include self-harm, suicidal ideation, very low mood, morose, and the possibility of suicide. So depression can be in addition to autism and affect the long-term outcome. We also have an association between autism and ADHD, so impulsive, uh, difficulties with executive functioning, planning, organizing, all those sorts of things which are going to affect your quality of life. So that dimension needs to be assessed. So when you have autism, you also need to assess for anxiety level, possibility of depression, signs of ADHD with appropriate treatment and support. But autism is associated with specific learning difficulties, which is dyslexia for reading, dyscalculia, which is a problem with mathematics, handwriting, dysgraphia, so their handwriting is very, very difficult. So you do need to assess their learning profile. IQ assessments are very useful because they may indicate problems with processing speed or the person is a visual learner rather than a verbal learner. So they learn by observation and watching people rather than listening to what they say. But having autism is going to make you feel different. And what may occur there is that there are characteristics of a personality disorder, borderline, narcissistic, etc. may well become apparent, maybe the shall we say, the pathway to a diagnosis that a psychologist or a psychiatrist recognises, ah, oh, profile of borderline personality disorder, but when you go deeper, you recognise actually there's autism there. They are not mutually exclusive, they can be an adaptation to autism. Now, something we're picking up more and more in my clinical work I am increasingly identifying is autism and trauma. Trauma in many ways, from bullying and teasing, abuse that may have occurred. And the problem with trauma is it depends on that person's perception of the situation and ability to cope. And so trauma specialization, as much as we look at those who know about ADHD, anxiety, depression, personality disorders, need to apply their skills, their skills in trauma, identification and treatment 
for autistic individuals, modified for autism. I'm also getting a lot more cases of gender dysphoria. That is, an autistic individual I may have known since they were two and three years old, now in their teenage years, are deciding, I want to change gender. And all the associations of and challenges with changing gender. Now, the research suggests that roughly at least one in three of those who are benefiting from gender dysphoria services, one in three have an autism spectrum disorder. So often such services are becoming increasingly aware of how they must adapt their assessment and support to accommodate autism. And the same goes for eating disorders. At least one in four, maybe one in three of those in an eating disorder for anorexia or bulimia and other eating disorders have autism and are now recognizing that their services need to adapt. For example, uh, group work. Well, often autistic individuals hate being in groups where the majority are neurotypical, but feel much more relaxed, comfortable, disclosing, open, receptive to suggestions if it's an all autistic group. So such services may have an autism specialist group that become aware of some of the issues of sensory sensitivity, social engagement, connectivity and so on. So it's not just a simple issue of putting on weight, it's also the issue of social engagement, connectedness, managing moods, sensory sensitivity and so on. So eating disorders is a new area. Also new, maybe the last five to ten years, is autistic girls and women. Uh, most people would have a picture of autism as a boy, but the girls can have exactly the same characteristics. It's not as though their autism is different. What is different is how they adapt to their autism. And one of the ways of adapting is very creative and very intelligent of, okay, I don't know how to socialize. I really don't get it. It's very complicated, but I need to do this. Okay, I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to be laughed at, but I do want to engage. I'll watch, I'll observe, analyze, and imitate. Now, a part of autism is a fascination with systems, mathematics, uh, or systems and patterns. Mathematics is the study of patterns. And so you're analyzing systems and patterns socially, and you are learning the rules. What happens here? What happens there? Then, right, that's it. I've got it. I am now confident enough to join in because I know what I'm supposed to do. Problem is, if they've never been in this situation before, they've not observed it, then they have major difficulties in that. So it's observing other people as a form of fascination, analyzing and becoming almost a psychologist. In fact, some will grow up to become psychologists, but then imitating, acting and doing it so well, they deserve an Oscar every day for their performance as neurotypical, but it's absolutely exhausting. You have no idea who the real self is and is, should we say, one of the major factors leading to a clinical depression. So what happens is that the person has multiple characters. The character of the person at school, often superb, responsive, the teachers think is wonderful, but you wait till they get home. They are two different characters. And parents will say, please, can you be the child that you are at school? And the school will say, well, if they're that bad at home, obviously you're a bad parent, you need to know how to manage them. But what the child has done is suppressed and compressed their confusion and exhaustion, but release it at home where they feel safe. It's also looking at friendships and sometimes um, autistic girls say girls are bitchy and mean and horrible and I can't trust them and they're, they gossip with each other. But boys, oh, boys are simple. Boys are easy. Boys are doing things. They're being creative. They're being physical in running and ball games. And so the girl may find that her preference amongst friendships is with boys and that may continue throughout the school years. 
But at high school, there can be the vulnerability of not very good at character judgments. And often in autism, my greatest concern is not the autistic individual, but it's what neurotypicals will do. So you may have an autistic teenager or young woman who doesn't understand the predators, the risky situations, and may unfortunately have sexual experiences that she did not want and regretted because she didn't read the signals and are very vulnerable in that situation. But going through to the adult years now, there are new issues, and that is being a partner and the expectations of a female partner, but also expectations of being a mother. And autistic mums can be brilliant mums, they can be superb mums, but they often lack confidence because they can't trust their intuition. So they may need a lot more reassurance. Now we're starting to get a lot of publications that work in this area. And my colleague Michelle Garnett and I have been working on supporting autistic girls and women because of the cultural and societal expectations. Now, what about autistic adults, a new area of exploration? We are starting to develop strategies for employment and making sure that that person finds the right job for them, that the workforce understands their autism, that they're not promoted to a job which is not within their capabilities, but to encourage employers to recognize that that individual's knowledge, integrity, attention to detail, all the various things can make them very successful in their employment. And to be successfully employed is very important for the autistic adult as an antidote to depression and also to show your true capabilities. There are a variety of books in this area. I've just written a one with my friend and colleague Michelle Garnet called Autism Working in English. Hopefully it'll be translated into Italian to help that person in the workforce, but also to explain autism to their colleagues and their line manager. Another dimension we're working on uh, with autistic adults is relationships. And that person has always wanted a friend and always wanted a relationship, and they have one. But this brings in new problems of relationship expectations. So again, with uh, my friend and colleague Michelle, we've been running a series of programs we call the Relationship Minefield for couples where one or both are autistic. And we go through the issues in terms of intimacy, that can be verbal, emotional and physical, communication improvements. We will also go through how to express love and affection for each other and understanding the non-verbal communication of both partners. Because sometimes we say that the autistic person has difficulty reading non-verbal communication in others. But neurotypicals can have problems reading the non-verbal communication of the autistic individual and make various mistakes. So we have new programs and activities to support relationships. There's also the issue of quality of life, what makes a good life. And some autistic individuals will find it by choosing a career where you don't have to meet lots of people, being a wildlife ranger, in a national park where all you see are foxes, deer, birds and plants and you don't have to socialise with people and in that situation your autism has virtually disappeared. But it's a lifestyle that you really enjoy, so it's your quality of life. But we're also starting to explore the ageing process in autism. 60 plus, what are the things that can occur? Actually a lot of good things and I've been involved in some research of how the person has a degree of self-understanding, self-acceptance, and should we say coming to terms with being different in a positive way. So we're looking at the aging. We're still looking at, are autistic individuals more prone to Parkinson's disease, dementia and so on, yet to know for sure, but we're starting to do research in this area. But what's also occurring now, and increasingly over the last few years, is the autistic voice and culture and to be proud of being autistic not seeing it as a defect in the diagnostic assessment i say this isn't a diagnosis it's a discovery we've discovered your autism so we go through being the authentic self be true to who you are 
There's a change in self-advocacy and group advocacy for autistic individuals. And terms, we now say an autistic person rather than a person with autism. The autism comes first. A more positive attitude and acceptance of autism but also to designing and implementing psychological therapy that has been designed by autistic individuals and administered by autistic individuals. So it may well be that the psychologist that you see has autism themselves and have designed a program for autistic individuals that is very appropriate to the different way of perceiving, thinking, learning and relating that I use to describe autism. But it's an adaptation to manage your anxiety, your depression, your sense of self, according to new knowledge designed from autistic individuals, not neurotypicals. And another thing that's occurring is autistic heroes that are in the media. Greta Thunberg and, uh, shall we say, the um, really looking at global warming. And she is a wonderful leader. Elon Musk and his knowledge in terms of car designs and future and so on. So we have autistic heroes, which is basically to say that in many ways we need autism. It adds diversity to our culture. And as Temple Grandin, a very famous autistic individual, said, if the world was left to you socialites, we would still be in caves talking to each other. So we are now celebrating autism. In the future, I would like to explore whether I won't be able to do the next 50 years, but I hope to be here for the next 10 to explore sensory sensitivity. Why is it there? How can we alleviate it? We know very little about it. Empathic attunement, the ability to perceive emotional state in other people, not by conventional means of reading facial expressions, body language, but just having a feeling that that person's sad, depressed, anxious, angry, and often being very accurate in perce perceiving emotional state in others, but it's not necessarily by conventional means. It's also the development of autism specialism and services. And that's what you have here for your conference today. A one-stop shop where there are professionals that develop the expertise in the many dimensions of autism. You go there and it may be something that is supportive for the whole of that person's life. So for my past uh, 50 years of excitement and or exploring autism, I look forward to the more things that I am going to explore. So please enjoy your conference <clears throat> and continue learning as I do. <laughs>